Ladies and gentlemen, just a quick announcement. We are getting the table set up for round four of the Masters. And once we are ready with all the technical background and table setup, then we will let you know. We'll start in a few minutes. You're playing recon too, right? This is the uh, War Room PL Street. I probably want to use the, this one because I'm trying to side through my right there. It's guns they use, so just so I
So the respective list pairing will be revealed in just a minute. So you heard it here first folks, we have Denny Wan going into Calandra. We're just getting the other recordings set up and running and then we will commence with this game shortly. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are. We are coming to you live from Amsterdam from the Clockon 2017 Masters Tournament Round 4. My name is George Busher and I will be your host for this game and hopefully many more in future. We are looking right now at uh, Toby Nathan who is playing his Calandra. Um, against Jonas Brand, who will be playing Denny One. So we're just going to get the UI updated. Yeah. 
and then we're gonna get underway players are just preparing their armies for deployment and I think we're gonna have a very interesting game Yes, we will also be changing the logos. I am currently doing that right now. So, let's take a look first at the scenario that the players will be playing today. We are looking at the scenario number six, Recon. This scenario features two rectangular zones on each flank, with the zone to the player's right-hand side also featuring a flag. The uh, map also features two objective on the center line with an 18 inch from the back edge of the deployment making it mainly vulnerable to ranged fire and uh, turn 3 and turn 4 pushes by melee forces okay. so with that let's take a look at the lists that the two players have brought we're starting first with uh, Toby Nathan, who has brought Trollbloods, and he has brought he has chosen his Calandra list in the theme force power of Dunia. Uh, she features a uh, free uh, rune bearer. Uh, she has uh, one, two, three, four, five storm trolls, a slag troll, and a. a Morix? 15 point Warbeast. Take a look at where he put it. Then we also have a Horgle with an attached Slag Troll. We have a Janissa, which is also for free. A Stone Chronicler, a Max Creelstone, and of course the Dunian not themselves. On Jonas' side, we have a Denny One who is. Uh, playing the Scourge theme force. She is bringing uh, two Death Rippers and two Stalkers. She is bringing two max units of Satixus Raiders, a maximum unit of Blood Witches with the UA, um, a unit of Gunslingers, uh, a unit of Crow's Cutthroats, max, and a Ragman. So, uh, very infantry heavy list going into a lightning list so we are guaranteed to be seeing a lot of casualties here we're going to be seeing a lot of models getting removed from the table and i think we're going to end up seeing a very desperate late game uh, scenario struggle for points when the models start running low So, 
I believe the players are ready to start at this point. And we are going to do this one as well. To the people who are watching on the stream right now, we are aware that there are issues with choppiness and we're doing our best that we can to avoid it, but it would mean having to shut down uh, multiple streams that we have running right now. Um, and that currently we don't think is, is worth doing because we, we want as many people watching this as possible. Uh, please do be aware that the recorded versions of these games uh, will not have any kind of choppiness. So when you watch this on uh, YouTube um, or if you watch it back on Facebook or later on Twitch, then the choppiness should be gone. This really is just an artifact uh, based on the fact that we're in a convention center and we're dealing with hotel internet and we have multiple streams running at the same time. Hopefully the quality audio content will make up for the slightly juddery uh, video. Uh, if not, uh, get in touch with us. Let us know on the, uh, on the YouTube uh, live stream, let us know on the Facebook live stream, and let us know on the Twitch live stream, whichever stream you're looking on and watching on. Uh, and if you want to get the better frame rates, just um, vote for which one of the other streams you would like to be eliminated. And then we can uh, have a little game of Survivor. But I don't think that will be necessary. I think it's much better to have as many people as possible uh, all watching the same great games. So deployment for Nathan is complete. And as Jonas is doing his deployment, I'm going to scoot up next to the table and get a real good look at where the important models are positioned so that I can show you guys on the teleprompter and give you a good impression of the deployment of the two players. ladies and gentlemen so Toby Nathan has deployed in the following manner he has his warcaster Kalandra sitting pretty right here she is flanked up and down this entire line by war beasts uh, including uh, obviously her slag trolls of which she has one uh, I believe it is here and the other slag troll, which is attached to Horgle, the other slag troll being here with Horgle right next to him. Uh, we have the uh, Dunia knot situated in the back of the line with the stone and the uh, other support staff um, in the middle, namely the Creel Stone and the Stone Chronicler. And we also have uh, Janissa in that uh, big bundle of troll forces somewhere. 
Okay. So I am getting the impression that the um, Twitch stream is experiencing some lag. And I will check now to see what the population on the other uh, live streaming channels is. And we may potentially we have one viewer on that one. We may potentially focus, try and focus our bandwidth on the Twitch stream to make sure that the video is good. So, if the viewers from YouTube and the Facebook live stream could migrate for now to the Twitch stream at www.twitch.com slash warroompl, which is all one word lowercase, then I will turn off those streams in an attempt to improve the frame rate for you guys. So I'm shutting down Facebook and YouTube streaming right now. And we're going to see if our video quality improves for the Twitch stream. Which apparently it has. I will just go and check it. Yes. This uh, field thing. What is it? What's that brain? That's rubble. It's rubble? All right. Yes. So this other guy was here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So hopefully this will have resolved the video frame rate issues. For all you people out there on the Twitch stream, I would ask you to let me know via the chat right now if the frame rates are good for you and if they've improved in the last minute or so. Oh, and by the way, um, Toby Nathan's trolls also feature one heavy war beast, namely a mauler, which is part of the uh, contingent of forces on the top half of the map. So we just have Toby Nathan uh, playing out his turn one, which essentially means that he is currently planning his turn two and three and revealing a certain aspect of that plan to his opponent by his positioning. Trolls, especially War Beast Heavy Trolls, being the less maneuverable uh, of the armies out there. Yeah. 
So the question here is lot initially going to be one of uh, attrition and balancing of threat ranges. Uh, the trolls having significantly less in the terms of melee threat, with the Satixis Raiders being able to outthrow them quite easily. But the ranged potential, uh, ranged infantry killing potential of the uh, troll list, which does in fact feature five storm trolls. Uh, that is very significant and that is not something Jonas can take lightly. So he will have to be very careful about moral placement, he will have to be very careful about how many models, infantry models he gives his opponent and how heavily he commits to taking on the war beasts. Uh, you can run one of your guys and then shoot him in there. Uh, like the oh. <laughs> you didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> but you will be sacrificing at yourself. So, the advantage of mobility is definitely in Jonas's favor here. He's, despite the fact that he's going second, he's going to be able to set the line of battle approximately here. If he uh, advances his forces to the point where he can have his stealth forces up front, uh, allowing them to be just that little bit closer to the storm troll line, and uh, with Satixis Raiders behind, he can threaten a very serious alpha strike by feeding potentially early, top of two for instance and uh, removing a large number of Toby's war beasts. Uh, Toby, on the other hand, obviously is going to want to grind this out. He's going to want to make sure to stay in his, uh, in his bubble from Calandra, of course. Uh, bringing Star Starcross obviously being a huge uh, matchup skew in terms of uh, damage output. And when you are facing a infantry army that will often rely on spikes in dice rolls to do significant damage to your war beasts, then that can go a long way towards mitigating that. Okay, so Jonas is choosing to go for the envelopment, positioning his crows on the far, far north flank. Um, to really force Toby to make a very hard decision, which is, do I go around this obstruction and risk getting cut off from my Warcaster? Or do I funnel south towards the middle of the map and stay within my Starcross bubble and try to force it out that way? In which case, it will be very easy for the crows to sneak through here and get into the underbelly of Toby's army. So those are some potential considerations. Um, I think for an army that has a numerical advantage, it's always wise to attempt to envelop your opponent and to control the table from all sides. Uh, I think it gives you a greater opportunity to exploit weaknesses in your opponent's army. And when a particular army relies on being clustered together, it's your job as an opponent to try and pull it apart. So we have uh, a pair of uh, stalkers making a play for the left zone. Keeping in mind to stay out of the advance and shoot range of the storm trolls, which with their stealth will be easily achieved. 
So what we're seeing right now is the uh, standard uh, walk and shoot electro leap threat range, which means that Jonas is just going to advance his entire line of Satixis Raiders up to that exact point to make sure that Toby has no lightning targets. And that is one of the keys to fighting an army that relies on electro leaps is to either give them nothing or to give them so many targets that they cannot possibly shoot through all of them, even with all of the electro leaps they have. Um, giving them a few pieces that they can shoot at every turn so that they can get value out of their electro leaps is a bad idea, in my eyes at least. So this is a fairly uh, normal play here, making sure to have the flanking arc node uh, in order to um, help secure a flank with a conveniently placed debuff. And um, we're probably going to be looking at having the uh, uh, second arc node on that hill right there on the right, uh, which is what he's doing right now. So, a nice wide uh, spread of potential threat vectors for uh, Denny's spells. So, the next turn is going to force uh, Toby uh, into a position where he will have to expose his Warbeats to Jonas's Alpha Strike. Uh, the question is how hard will Jonas commit to the Alpha Strike? Keeping in mind he does only have Satixus Raiders and debuff spells as his main tool for removing Toby's considerable number of war beasts, uh, and that's not something he can keep up too long and too far. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how heavily Toby commits to baiting Jonas, and then in return, how heavily Jonas commits in an attempt to score what will likely be a um, potentially significant attrition lead if he decides and manages to focus all of his damage potential in maybe one flank as opposed to spreading it out over two flanks to try and get a one-sided uh, tactical advantage in terms of play distance. Um, so utilizing these two stalkers as a uh, turn to uh, damage dealing units uh, against these war beasts which are making a push for the bottom zone might be able to put Jonas in a position to start scoring that so, Toby now has the unenviable task of knowingly walking into his enemy's threat ranges and having to figure out just how much damage he can take before it becomes a, a problem. So they have to very carefully balance just inside enough model threat ranges to make it worthwhile for your opponent to attack, but not to the point where he will gain a significant advantage out of it strategically. Okay. So, in terms of useful attacks that Toby is going to get this turn, I am not currently seeing any of them on the table. 
which means that uh, but that is not necessarily a bad thing uh, in my eyes having being put in a position where you can do no actual damage to your opponent allows you to focus very specifically only on positioning uh, for following turns and can sometimes result in the ability to play a fairly quick turn uh, it does however require uh, decisiveness so I think we're just uh, seeing Toby check a uh, shot range on that stalker with what I believe is a slag troll. Let me check. <laughs> so the model currently being measured from over here is in fact a slag troll. The rest of them, the three war beasts, one, two, three, four, being uh, storm trolls. So it seems that Toby has made a decision on how he's going to play his left flank. Uh, this is a fairly cautious advance from uh, Horgor and his slag troll. Obviously the slag troll not being well equipped to deal with a unit of crow's cutthroats. So his main job is probably going to be to uh, take a round or two of shooting to the face and to try and keep Horgor safe so that they can start pressuring that left zone and potentially forcing the cutthroats to come close to the point where they can be engaged mm -hmm. and dealt with in me. So, uh, keep in mind that the Denny one that we are seeing here is the Denny one still in her full glory, I believe. So, this, uh, so all the usual Denny one things, such as the 24 inch Scourge Knockdown Assassination, still apply and will always continue to apply to Toby when he's doing his positioning here. Um, obviously, Jonas does not have that many guns to take advantage of that kind of an assassination, uh, but a stalker will do it in the right place at the right time. That is completely doable. So we have the slag troll going for it now. So Toby is committing the slag troll here to killing the stalker and we are going to see just how much damage he can do he will use his puppet master to re-roll the miss and miss again on the re-roll and will buy a reroll. All or nothing, and he misses again for the third time. That is very unfortunate. Um, being able to get a slack draw hit on those stalkers. Those stalkers are essentially the only viable targets for the slag troll to even shoot at, and chances are he's not going to get more than one shot. So uh, missing that one shot three times in a row is very unfortunate for Toby. Really, it's just... But you move on.
So it looks like Toby is going to commit just one of his war beasts to contesting the bottom zone and will be shifting the primary focus of his push more along this axis. that will to some degree take advantage of the line of sight blocking terrain here by denying charge lanes from these models it will play into the fact that these crow's cutthroats on the far right side of the table will be essentially out of range and unable to contribute and it forces your opponent to close in through these choke points allowing you hopefully uh, as a as the troll player to pick one side and completely wipe it out whilst holding for the second wave coming from the other side So Stone is uh, popping the aura and running. Uh, going to take a look here. Uh, going to be an important piece of placement this turn for the Stone in order to make sure that his turns three and four uh, will continue even after the Stone unit starts taking casualties to provide that uh, aura to as many of Toby's war beasts as possible. So. If you were wondering why the slag troll was allowed to reroll twice, that is because of Calandra's fate blessed ability, which allows her to spend fury to allow another model in her army within her control to reroll uh, an attack roll. which technically is supposed to allow you to get a very high certainty on those critical shots, you know, those slag troll shots. And um, that what, that's, I think, what makes it doubly frustrating for Toby right now, is that uh, the chances of it going off were, I would say, very decent. But at the end of the day, this is a dice game. This is what happens. and. This is why it's a challenge, because we have to roll with the punches and we have to figure out a way to get through and to adapt to our game plan. So I believe that Toby is now finished with his turn. Yeah. Uh, with 43 minutes left on his clock. And Jonas is now starting his second turn with 40 eight minutes left on his clock and here come the ambushes so for those of you who are familiar with this theme force you may have spotted it during the deployment phase that Jonas in fact did not deploy his blood witches at the beginning of the game and the reason is because he wanted to ambush them. Meaning that the scenario timer on the bottom zone just started. And the ability to apply a lateral threat straight into the vulnerable support elements of Calandra's army 
will go a long way to making it easier for the frontline forces, the Satixis raiders, the pistoliers, um, sorry, gunslingers, and the cross cutthroats to chew through all of those boxes that Toby has presented him with. So there, you can't see it on screen, but just below where the camera cuts off, there is a line of blood witches, all deployed and ready to make their way onto the field. So this is a very exciting turn of events. Uh, Jonas has very close to uh, having Toby surrounded on three sides. And that is really going to apply a lot of pressure uh, on Toby in the following turns. But the critical thing for Jonas will be is whether or not he can roll good dice. Uh, at this point, he, just in terms of army list composition, what he's brought to the table, there is nothing that he has that he can just remove half of Toby's army without needing at least statistically average dice rolls. If he, uh, if he drops the ball and starts rolling ones everywhere, then it could become a very quick descent into just a meat grinder where infantry are just fried left, right and center. So what we see here is one and two fully loaded stalkers. Uh, it seems most likely that their primary targets are going to be these two storm trolls over here, uh, allowing Jonas to start scoring this bottom zone. Uh, if he does so and he manages to get one of the stalkers into this trench here, then he has a fairly uh, durable scoring model that he can hold in that zone and uh, just defend with a screen of Satixis Raiders um, to make sure that Toby can't get in there. The flanking blood witches that will be coming later this turn are going to double that pressure uh, on Toby uh, to hold that right flank. And if I had to make a prediction now, my prediction would be that the first zone which is scored will be this bottom zone. Grabsnik mentions that it looks pretty bad for Toby. Um, only in terms of uh, table space. Uh, so Jonas definitely controls huge parts of the table. However, Toby has a fairly good grip, potentially even a stronger grip on the scoring parts of the table. And at the end of the day, that is what matters. So once we see this flank and these raiders come in and these these sides all collapsing inwards to engage Toby's models then we are going to see quite a, a rapid shift in how the table looks and as Jonas starts to lose more and more infantry the situation will get bleaker and bleaker potentially he will be more reliant on good dice rolls at the later stage of the game than he is now. <laughs> so we have the first chicken. Uh, top chicken is going to go for it. I know it's not a chicken, but uh, they jump. So Maybe kangaroo, the first kangaroo. Crick's kangaroo is going for it. Uh, Starting off with a jump in order to get a charge lane at what appears to be a juicier target, potentially even the real stone bearer. I'm not sure on the ranges. 
No, it doesn't look like he's going for the Creel Stone, but he is. It does look like he is going for a flanking position on the Storm Troll whilst engaging uh, one of the. Maybe I believe this that is the stone chronicler that he is also engaging. So let's take a look at the top view for some uh, dice and uh, hitbox action. So we do have a Denny feat. So the damage that we are going to be seeing on this storm troll will be significant. First hit doing eight boxes. So the second attack also hits on, I believe, the that is the Stone Chronicler, I believe. He's also removed from the table. And now we're looking to see the second stalker go in and potentially finish the job the first stalker started. Which is what it looks like uh, is happening right now. Yeah. So that first storm troll has already taken eight boxes and he's probably about to take a whole lot more. I believe he takes nine more damage, leaving him on five boxes. We have another attack which is boosted to hit. It gets him through the uh, through the defense, and we're looking at a kill. One storm troll down. Four more left to go. Piece by piece. So now we see Jonas turning his attention to the Satixis gunslingers, I believe. Oh no, uh, my apologies, I believe this is probably Ragman who's going to be setting up a death field for the Satixis Raiders to take out the lead uh, Slag Troll. So we have the Satixis Raiders going in now. And we will see how many uh, Jonas commits to this. And what kind of a follow up he will have. So, with De Negra standing right here behind the objective and having feated, it is very likely that she has probably clipped this entire front line with the feet. Potentially, the Hog or Slag Troll duo on the very north. Uh, zone uh, might have been spared from the feet, but we will see.
So, because we want to see what's going to happen with the Blood Witches, we have the camera angle looking pretty low because the Blood Witches are about to enter the screen, uh, which does mean you cannot see the clock on the screen. So, as a quick clock update, we have 43 minutes left on the clock for Toby, and we have 37 minutes left for Jonas. So we are going to be seeing some damage rolls coming now from Jonas onto initially the league lead slag troll here with a variety of So let's take a look right here how many Satixis Raiders it takes to kill a Slag Troll, who is currently sitting at armor 17, having gone up to a 19 and then back down because of Denny's feet. Taking seven boxes for the first hit. And taking nothing for the second hit. So we might potentially be looking at a miss. Oh, hit. No, we have a hit. So, uh, yeah, let's see if Jonas can finish off this slide troll. That is a very good way to go. Look at that. Down to five boxes left, ladies and gentlemen. Down to five boxes, this slag troll. It looks like this will be a very brutal end to a failed one-hit wonder. Um, he didn't even get the one hit that he wanted to, which is uh, very sad. However, Jonas has popped his feet. Toby still has his. And the question is, can Jonas get enough work done during this turn to make the feat worth it? So I believe we are now looking at the damage that is incoming on this Storm Troll over here, who has been engaged by three Satixis Raiders. Wow, getting through the armor even with his power 10, rolling dice well just helps. We're going to take a look via the top cam to get a better look at the dice. Another huge damage roll for Jonas here, he is tearing through these trolls. These storm trolls are getting absolutely demolished. And it looks like another one's about to go down. Now these Satixis Raiders are being pushed back by the repulses from the Storm Trolls. And I believe that's it. That. So we currently have two Storm Trolls and a Slag Troll down for uh, Toby. and no significant casualties for Jonas thus far. The question is, will the Mauler be the next victim? Does Jonas have enough damage in order to take this Mauler off the board? Sorry, this Storm Troll. The Mauler being further back. Allow me to check. Uh, arms and 
So this is indeed uh, a storm troll that is now being engaged. So having seen how it went with the other two storm trolls, it looks like uh, the three now looking like four Satixus Raiders that are going to get into melee with this storm troll are going to be able to do it. And he's even sending in a fifth one which may be too much. So Jonas decides to commit five Satixus Raiders to melee the Storm Troll. He deployed them in such a way that the repulse effect does as little damage as possible. So jamming in the first model and then jamming in models behind it at an angle. Once again, jamming this in and then this one. Thereby, if he activates this Satixus Raider first, he will get both of his attacks. He can activate this Satixus Raider, who will get both of his attacks without getting repulsed. And then he can activate the rear Satixus Raiders to get their two hits, and they will get repulsed. So it's a, a good way to ensure that you get as many attacks as possible. That is a bad start. But it still hits. So we're looking at dice off five here, which is uh, a lackluster starting roll here. So there we go. Uh, just making sure to get all the star star cross rolls in there, just in case that extra one is rolled. So he's now working through his uh, Satixus Raiders, doing all of their attacks. We're onto the second one with a decent bunch of damage. Four coming from the charge attack, which is not bad, but it doesn't look like it is enough. Although a couple of sixes will fix that. But the Starcross seems to be holding so far for this third Storm Troll to be taking a pounding from the Satixus Raiders. So Jonas has two more Satixus Raiders to attack with. Uh, in this case, being saved by Starcrossed by being forced to roll an additional die and having that die be better than the other two that he rolled before. Uh, there being the repulse, and then we have another charge attack coming in, hoping for big damage here. This is going to be oh, and there you have it. He gets the sixes when he needs them, ladies and gentlemen. We have Storm Troll number three kicking the bucket. Remember, these Storm Trolls have not yet had the chance to fire. They have not yet had the chance to shoot anybody or do any kind of electro leaping shenanigans. And Toby is down to two Storm Trolls. He is really going to have to get some, some damage out of the rem models that he has remaining. Now still left, we have the Satixus Gunslingers who are positioned in the rubble to the south that are being measured from right now. Uh, Jonas probably forced to commit them to the zone in order to get a uh, gunshot range onto the troll, storm troll over there. Getting a good hit. and fluffing the damage rolls. So nothing spectacular going on in that department. Ending the activation for the gunslingers, uh, having only used, put one of them within the zone and keeping the other two as reserve pieces for uh, later points in the game. 
now come the crows who are essentially undoing their extreme white flank maneuver they performed last turn and who are now making a push for the top zone they are largely safe from uh, Toby's war beast uh, having Toby having a lot of his charge and trample lanes blocked off by this uh, impossible terrain this obstacle right here and then Jonas has chosen to send a portion of his squad on a flanking mission to put pressure most likely on Horgel and to try and potentially get a snipe there so in terms of offensive capability it looks like we are probably going to see about six shots on this mauler or is he choosing to go for the storm trolls it looks like he may be choosing to go for the storm trolls Yes, it does look like he's going for the Storm Troll. That being uh, this model right here. So, obviously, Crow's Cutthroat Raiders have great damage potential, but only from behind. And uh, Jonas is experiencing that right now being able to plink a few points of damage into the storm troll but nowhere near enough to actually threaten anything so for the reposition we have a very interesting maneuver here he is actually extending the flanking maneuver with the crow's cutthroats and he is pulling back from the top zone he's going to probably leave only one crow maybe two crows to contest so he leaves two crows to contest the zone and he pulls the remainder back to the outside flank where they are reasonably safe so really in no rush to commit these uh, crow's cutthroats and really trying to bide his time to make sure that he gets the uh, back strike next turn which is and and that's when crow's cutthroats really start to shine is when they when they get those sweet sweet back strike shots so Jonas has now crossed over onto Bobby's side of the table in order to uh, invade his space both physically and strategically on the table and he is now activating his blood witches and I believe we are just going to see them parked nicely outside of any relevant threat ranges and in position to uh, do some serious damage to the uh, stones, uh, stone unit next turn uh, like we mentioned earlier putting immense pressure on Toby's right flank and with that, uh, Jonas concludes his turn, having now 24 minutes left on his clock. So, um, the disadvantage of the infantry heavy list being apparent here. So, but overall, I think on balance, if you look at the kind of turn he had, he was able to remove the entire front line of uh, heavy war beasts. He has yet to take any damage whatsoever. And so uh, I think he can, he can be quite safe in saying that the time, sure, that the time investment he has made in uh, prosecuting this strike uh, he said no. okay <laughs> he senses something coming I think <laughs> so Jonas has now been given a temporary reprieve whilst uh, Toby uh, answers the call of nature and is able to casually enjoy a sandwich 
alongside his apparent and a beer alongside his apparently imminent victory. <laughs> so it's uh, looking from a distance. Uh, Jonas seems very uh, very happy with how the turn played out. He corrects himself quickly. Uh, being the Crix player that he is, he uh, is only happy when the opposing player's entire army is destroyed in one turn. Uh, anything less than that is subpar. Like <laughs> so whilst we wait for uh, Toby to get back, I'll just take a look at the table so I can show you the exact layout of Toby's remaining forces. So Toby is now returning to the table having 40 minutes of left on the clock and beginning his turn three. He has, in terms of remaining forces left, he has a storm troll that has been undamaged uh, guarding the bottom zone. He has a mauler which is equally undamaged towing into the top zone. Next to the mauler there is a storm troll which has a few boxes on it, I believe five, but is further undamaged. And next to those we have Horgor with his slag troll who are both undamaged. Further we have, uh, let's see, Janissa right here and Kalanja right here with the stone unit and Dunia not bringing up the rear. Uh, other than that, uh, Toby has most of his fighting forces concentrated heavily on the left and is now put into a position where he has to figure out how to prevent his right flank from collapsing. He is briefly considering, as all players uh, who are put into the position do, uh, can I kill my opponent's caster? That being Denegra right there, which is currently camping one focus, I believe. And the answer to that question is probably no. So... Toby has to think very carefully about how he's going to equalize this this massive attrition disadvantage that he has. Um, he definitely needs to do something about the large cluster of Satixis Raiders in the middle of the board. Uh, with with mm -hmm. Paras even even without the Denegra feed, with Parasite an arced parasite coming through either this arc node here or this arc node here now if you combine the threat ranges of an arced parasite for those two arc nodes he can cover an area basically up to here <laughs> in potential debuffs that means and toby's entire army is vulnerable to getting parasited and the satixis raiders will just kill it um, including the mauler which is the heaviest war beast that Toby has in his army and the heaviest war beast he has left on the table. Uh, unfortunately the um, the defensive advantage of Starcrossed did not save Toby's war beasts from the Alpha Strike. Uh, in this situation you want at least one or two war beasts to survive. On low health? Sure disabled uh, system not a problem but you want at least one or two of those warbies to be able to be alive and to do something like clear out for the Texas Raiders uh, you need those you need that trade you need to be able to trade each one of your warbies for three to four Texas Raiders preferably more um, 
Now the idea was the storm trolls was to get an advantage to get up a leg a leg up on that uh, by lightning uh, bolting these Texas Raiders off the table. But so far, a single Electro Leap has yet to hit the table. Um, I don't imagine the bottom storm troll getting the opportunity to do any kind of Electro Leaping, which means that Toby is left potentially with only one Electro Leap to take on Jonas's army of 40 infantry. So it's going to have to happen in melee and it's going to ha have to happen over the next couple of turns and Toby is going to have to manually slog his way uh, punch by punch through all of these these 30 Cetixes. Um The crows he can for a while leave alone as long as he postures up defensively and doesn't give them the backstrike bonus he can potentially bunker up behind this objective around here um, he will have a very hard time defending this bottom zone and is under great pressure right now to deal with these two stalkers because if he does not next turn Kalandra dies I would say um, especially if she's in a position where she is now to get parasited from this arc node and then we could be seeing a very quick end to the game that is assuming Jonas uh, takes the bait and goes for the assassination which isn't even a risky assassination at best you are giving your opponent two stalkers and an arc node potentially for free but only assuming that your opponent has enough damage output left to kill those two stalkers and that arc node which Toby on the right flank currently does not and even if he does the 20 Satixus Raiders that would follow this this push would be enough to clear the board afterwards so I think we are going to have to see some creative tramples combined with some expertly some expertly placed tramples potentially maybe trampling the mauler to this position over here and buying attacks to remove up to six Satixus Raiders that would be a worthwhile trade if you can make it happen but the high defense will make that very very tricky and he will most likely lose the mauler next turn but if he doesn't then he has a model that is in position to potentially threaten Jonas's warcaster and at this point it's unlikely that Toby will win this game on scenario so as a player you have to ask yourself what is my win condition do I even have a win condition and if you have one no matter how unlikely you have to go for it which may be what we are going to see now coming from Toby So probably the key activation this turn will be the topmost storm troll and the mauler. Uh, between the two of them, I would want them to kill at least six to seven infantry models uh, in order for Toby to even have a hope of surviving the retaliation that is coming next turn. He may potentially have to expose uh, Calandra herself uh, to a situation where she may take a couple of attacks, one or two or three. Um, in order to save the rest of your models from getting steamrolled. 
So I think uh, a combined set of potentially very risky but potentially fruitful plays in my eyes are now needed on Toby's side um, in order to force Jonas into a position where he has to rely on dice and then it's up to Toby to channel all of his karma to ensure that Starcross does its job and that Jonas uh, attempts an assassination that overexposes him and fails or attempts to gain an attrition advantage by removing more war beasts and then failing in that. So no matter what happens in the next several activations, Toby is in a situation where he has to put himself at great risk and he has to hope that Jonas rolls bad dice. Um, judging by the way the game has gone so far, that seems quite unlikely. Um, Jonas's dice haven't been ridiculous, but when it's counted, he's uh, delivered, especially on some of those uh, nice, spiky uh, Satixis Raider damage rolls on feet turn. And, uh, and a couple of those will go a very long way uh, in this matchup. So a couple of boosted damage rolls where you manage to avoid rolling a one and you roll only good dice is uh, is key so Grabsnik uh, rightfully uh, informs us that the Mauler can trample only eight inches and it doesn't have Pathfinder which means that the the assassination threat and following turns is severely mitigated the question is is whether or not the distance from the back of the Mauler's base to the back of this Satixis Raider's base is 8 inches or not. Um, so we are seeing now Toby checking a line of sight to Denegra because she is in fact towed into this forest and she does appear to be at a position where one can draw a line that is shorter than three inches through this forest in order to get a line of sight. Now we may have to take a look whether or not this is viable or whether or not this Satixis Raider right here is blocking the potential angle. So we're just going to have some very careful measurements going on here. So, Toby is just thinking through his options right now, and I think he is realizing he doesn't have many. Um, there is not much that he can apply at range, having only two Storm Trolls and a Slag Troll. Uh, the Slag Troll being woefully out of position to target any significant uh, enemy models at best he can kill a, cru a cutthroat um, which is at this stage in the game not enough so potentially we might be looking at a boosted force blow coming out of Calandra onto Denegra in order to knock her down. The question 
I have is how would you follow that up? So we're looking potentially at a throw from what I think is the bottom storm troll to do a throw on the stalker right here. So it doesn't look like the lane is there. Yeah. So we have the storm troll activating now. He's being outside of melee, so not taking the free strike. He's going to advance. Yeah. It looks like we're seeing it. He's going to advance and he's going to perform a throw. And Jason has just informed his opponent that this particular troll was within the Denegro one feet and therefore cannot perform special attacks. Which pretty much just shoots down the plan that Toby had. <laughs> So the lightning trolls inability, sorry, the storm trolls inability to make a power attack in this situation has cost Bobby severely. He has invested 16 minutes of his clock into this plan and has now found out that it doesn't work. Obviously now is the time to search for alternatives. So it's just doing some uh, fury calculation with Kalandra to see how much he can get done with two fourth blows. This is a very tricky situation. Uh, Toby is now at a point where he is at a disadvantage in terms of clock with regards to Jonas. Jonas having just spent shy of 20 minutes on his feet turn, more close to about 16 minutes on his feet turn. Toby having just spent approximately 15 minutes on thinking through this potential assassination uh, and a crucial component of which was throwing this stalker away uh, that has now come undone and now we are going to see a befuddle on the Satixis or not. He's still thinking about it. T 
Toby right now just taking a look at what his options are in terms of spending his fury. And trying to decide what he's going to do. You can tell he is not hopeful about his current situation. And has been put in a very, very serious positional nightmare by Jonas, who now has him fully surrounded. Um, not only has he been surrounded, he has now given up the bottom zone in order to attempt this potential assassination piece so in order to get the power attack that he thought he was able to do he has removed his storm chomp so now we have Kalanja activating this is it so here comes the first befuddle is going down on a Satixis Raider and she needs a 60 hits and he gets it so now triggering the 3 inch advance He's going to position this Satixis in such a way with its back that I believe will enable a line of sight to be drawn between these models, ignoring Ragman because of his stealth and opening a line of sight to Denegro. Oh, no, it looks like the befuddle is to enable the correct positioning of the charge. Yeah. And that's it. There we have the concede by Toby. GG. We have a win by Jonas with his De Negro one. Uh, Toby conceding because of the complete uh, lack of options. Which means that. Okay. So also we have uh, multiple factors here. We have uh, the stone having been required to activate first in order to strip the stealth off the Negra. Uh, he failed to do so and activated Kalandra before having activated the, the stone and then was put in the position of having an attack but not being able to hit anything. So they're just running right now through how the assassination attempt would have gone had Toby uh, activated the stone correctly first. They're rolling it out. Yeah, and they're going to roll it out now. Um, even at best, this seems a very low odds assassination chance. Needing a feated eight, yeah. So very low odds uh, chance of assassination uh, not going off here on the Negro one, being played out of a position of um, exasperation. Uh, there has so far not been a single casualty on Jonas's side. He has been completely surrounded on the table. He has managed to remove. Uh, I believe four light war beasts. Uh, 
and uh, for no damage on his part and as such he has a, a dominating attrition and soon to be now scenario lead so now the players are just rolling out the hypothetical assassination Kalandru going in and uh, using Puppet Master on the to hit using the feet reroll sorry and then trying to drop the Denny with uh, the POW 12s using massive dice after which he would Puppet Master for a better damage roll and re-roll the two to do six damages six damage to Denegra and then she would do it again having I believe no more fury left and just having to hard roll and then having to spike massively for damage using the timely re-rolls and then potentially causing 10 damage in total with Kalandra's activation even with all of the re-rolls and the Puppet Master indeed yeah the amount of re-rolls uh, allows you to actually do uh, a decent amount of damage fairly reliably but as far as I can see, Kalandra really is the only model that has any chance with potentially Janissa. Yeah. Potentially Janissa going in with a, with a rock hammering the objective to try and clip the Negra with the house with the dice minus seven. Getting to re-roll the one again. And doing another two points. Uh, yes, the the POW 10 from the Storm Troll. That is the question if that is in if the objective is in range and whether or not the Storm Troll can get to a point without being engaged by the lead Satixis Raider. Just measuring it out now. So he can position in such a way that he is not engaged by the Satixis Raider, by the lead Satixis Raider up front right here. And then he will walk to this position to arc, to take a shot on the objective and arc one E leap, the first E leap of his game. That he would have been able to do and then getting one final power 10 needing uh, some boxcars shenanigans <laughs> with dice minus four needing to roll a hard nine to kill easy he proclaims <laughs> Which he does. So did you give up before this? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it happened on stream, boys. So you can't say, uh, "Hey, we rolled it out. It worked, right?" <laughs> I got the take back. <laughs> you gave me the take back, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. So I just we just want to see if had the if the plan had material materialized then we would be looking at a potentially dead Denegra one in this situation but unfortunately because the order of activation uh, is important uh, Toby was left attempting to attack a target that had stealth and conceded the game so well played to both players uh, well played for to Toby for being able to come up with uh, 
an incredibly complicated but still viable assassination under immense pressure and uh, well played to Jonas for being able to bring an all infantry Crick's list and not lose a single model I mean that is impressive so, well done to both players and we will be uh, taking a short break here now and we look forward to seeing all of you again uh, as soon as possible in round five I've been George Busher, your host, and we are reporting live from ClogCon 2017, the Masters Tournament. I hope you've all had a good time watching. I hope the quality of the play and the quality of the material has been up to snuff. Any comments that you have, I would love to hear them on the chat, and we will see you soon. Stay tuned for round five. Thank you.